great honour to chat to you about the work that my lab does. So a few questions. So I'm going to talk to you about genetics. Do we know what DNA is? Put our hands up. Yeah? Do you know what chromosomes are? Do you know what a DNA mutation is? Great! I'll go. <laughs> Job done. So, that's brilliant. <clears throat> um, uh, there we are. So I will um, give you a very basic overview um, of our current state of play in our understanding of the DNA that is abnormal in patients with CLL. Um, and I will also tell you a little bit about some of the work that we do and how we've contributed to our understand that understanding. And then hopefully persuade you that it's quite important and it can help the way we manage patients with, with this particular disease. So I am a professor in cancer sciences. I work very closely with Francesco and with Andy and with Peter, who you've met. So we're all a very close team. And I suppose that's my first point, really, is that um, that's what we are. There's supposed to be an arrow there. Um, but there, there were basically seven PIs. Those are principal investigators. Those are group leaders working in Southampton. These are five of them working particularly on CLL. There's a lovely arrow that goes behind that. I think some of the animation has gone a bit wrong, I'm afraid. But we have a pipeline in CLL, a research pipeline. So we start with Francesco, who's a clinical expert. Um, it goes through genomics, through Andy Steele, who's here, and through Graham Packham and Mark Cragg, to take the observations we find in the clinic all the way through to understanding truly their importance in the context of the disease. The hope is, as Francesco's outlined, outlined is we can then take those observations and we can feed them back into improving the care of the patients with this particular disease. Now, in addition to working very closely within Southampton, we have a large number of national collaborators and we are fortunate to have a lot of European collaborators, but I don't know how easy that will be moving forward. I'm sure it will. I'm sure we'll continue to work very effectively with, with them. So as you've already heard, my, my talk's a little bit more but basic, so I hope it's not too basic for you, but um, as you already know, leukemia is the cancer of the blood, and it's really the accumulation of poorly functioning white cells of different types, and that defines the type of leukemia you have, and it's that accumulation of poorly functioning white cells that drive symptoms, and obviously it's very tightly controlled, um, so that the production of cells is the same as the death of cells, and you have a nice equilibrium in the way that your cells in your body are controlled. But in leukemia, of course, sometimes you get uh, um, an increased production of cells, and or you can get a decreased death of cells, and that cause, causes a, an increase in the equilibrium, increase in the, in, in the number of cells that we have in our blood. And... It can be defined as either lymphoid or myeloid and acute and chronic. And of course, we're all here to talk about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This is a, a hemopoietic diagram just showing you all the different types of white cells that we have in our bodies. Myeloid cells are over here, lymphoid cells are here. And this is the B lymphocyte, which you've heard quite a lot about this morning. And these are the cells that are affected by in, in patients with CLL. Uh, you can see the normal cells, and then you can see our tumor CLL cells here. And ever since we discovered the B cell in 1971, and, and we concomitantly con identified CLL as a disease, it's been known that there's incredible heterogeneity in the, pa the way patients respond. And you've heard about that really uh, eloquently from Francesco. And genetics can help with that, because... There's a great deal of genetic diversity, and that genetic diversity reflects the clinical diversity. So hopefully we can use genetics to direct how we treat and manage these particular patients. So we all know what a cell is. Sorry if it's a bit basic. The cell is the, the building block. There's, about, about, there's trillions of cells, maybe 200 types of different cell. That's why we have 200 different types of cancer, because every but every cell can, can develop into a malignant condition. And of course, they have a lot of different tasks. 
And here you can see a nice diagram, and I'm going to focus on the nucleus, which is this blue bit. So that's the control center of the cell. And within that is the DNA, which I've established that you all know what that is. So that's fantastic. Do we know what these are? These are. This is a karyogram of a normal. Can we tell the gender of this patient? Female. Fantastic. So there are two X chromosomes. There's a man who would have one X and one Y chromosome. So this technique called G banding, we use a, a reagent to digest away the DNA. And some bits of DNA digest better than others, and then we use a stain and we end up getting these bands. And this has been used since the 1970s. In fact, it was in Salisbury where this particular technique was first established. And it allows us to identify all the chromosomes that exist. And also, because if, if changes happen, we can look at the pattern and, it, and we can use this diagnostically. So in, in labs and hospitals, this work is done. To try and understand what chromosome abnormalities exist in patients with cancer, but also with other human diseases. So, we have our chromosome, which is in our nucleus, and it's bound, lots of DNA, so there's two meters of DNA in every one of our cells. And so really, for the cell to control that, one of the things it does is it binds them into chromosomes around proteins. So this is supercoiled DNA. And as you uncoil it, you see the DNA structure that we all know about, the different base pairs within the DNA, and a collection of those base pairs makes a gene, and a gene makes a protein, and a protein has a function within each of our cells. And it's the sort of regulated proteins that drive disease. So this is a, another karyogram. The, the gender of this one is, is male, because we have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Now we've just painted the chromosomes in different colors. The technique called FISH. Again, it's used a lot in the diagnosis of human diseases within hospitals. And take the two things I want you to identify or, or, or concentrate on are that we should have two. Two of each of our chromosomes, unless we're a man and then we obviously have a Y and just one X. So we should have two, and they should be the same color. Right? So that shows a normal chromosome and in its appropriate number of copies. But this is the unfortunate reality of what can happen in cancer. It doesn't look quite right, does it, does it? Lots of things that we shouldn't expect to happen. So, what are they? Well, we have more chromosomes than we ought to have. And you can imagine if a gene's on that chromosome and you've got more copies, then it's expressed more highly and then could contribute to the disease. We have chromosomes that don't look quite the right size. We've lost bits. And again, if you've got a really critical gene in that region that's lost, you can imagine that that would be an important thing to happen within the cancer cell. And what you'll also notice is that some chromosomes are more than one colour. For example, here we've got one chromosome that's made up of a bit of chromosome 3, a bit of chromosome 10, a bit of chromosome 1. Now, well, that shouldn't happen, and that's the result of the changes that occur in the cancer cell. Now, it's quite tricky, because a lot of these rearrangements that we see are probably not important to cancer at all. Cancer, the genome in cancer cells become very unstable, and, it, and errors just happen some of those errors will target key genes and they will drive the, the cancer. So as a cancer geneticist, which I am one, it's, the skill is to try and identify what the important changes are, the drivers, in the context of all the noise, and we call those passengers. Those abnormalities just along for the ride, they're not driving the disease. That is not the only car example I will give you. So, this, uh, these are two chromosomes, and then you can imagine that genes are located all the way down these chromosomes um, at, at the different spaces, but any change of the chromosome can change the function and structure of the genes. Check this out. See that? 50 <laughs> minutes on PowerPoint doing that. <laughs> 50 minutes. But you can imagine that a gene that was Breaking, uh, branching that breakpoint there is now been moved, juxtaposed to a, to a different gene, and that gene can have an abnormal function 
within the context of the piece itself. Now, I couldn't learn all that skill just for one slide. So here's a second slide. Now, this didn't take me 50 minutes. This took me 30 minutes. And what happens now is you can imagine we've got some genes all the way down here, and this is an inversion. And these, these, these happen in cancer cells, and you can imagine that when a chromosome, the gene is here, and it's relocated down here, and it's controlled by a different type of uh, abnormality, and that contributes to, to cancer. And there were lots of different chromosomal changes that can occur, and they're, and they're listed here. So we have structural changes that basically move one bit of the chromosome from one chromosome to another, and that can obviously rearrange the genome and change the way genes function. And then we've got copy number changes, so we've got abnormalities that can make too many genes or too few genes. And again, you can imagine that those genes, if you have too few, make too little protein, and therefore don't have the effect that they would on in normal cells. We have whole chromosomes can be gained and lost in cancer, and then we have DNA mutations that can exist at the single base pair level. So all these types of abnormalities exist. Some of them are going to be passengers, some of them are going to be drivers, and we have to find the drivers because they're the ones that we can use to help manage uh, these patients. So is this clinically important? You'll, you'll have seen these kaplan meyer curves before, and what all this one is, is showing you is that depending on the type of chromosome abnormality you have, so this is deletion 17P that Francesco mentioned, so deletion of the P53 gene, or the guardian of of the genome, as it's called, it's a really important gene in how cells are controlled, their, their, their division is controlled. And if you have one of those, obviously you don't do so well as if you have a 13Q deletion where your outcome is be better. Now, I've, I've simplified the story uh, a little bit there for you, but in essence, hopefully that shows you how abnormalities can be used to guide better, better patient management, predict outcome, to choose the most appropriate therapy and uh, assess how a patient might respond. This is not my car. But hopefully it will describe to you some of the properties in the cancer cell and why they might be important. Because of course a car is a highly engineered bit of kit. It has to interact with other cars on the road. It has to go where you want it to go at a speed that is safe to travel. And that's all those properties that a car needs a cell needs as well. And you can imagine that if your brakes go, your car careers out of control, and that, that brake can go in a cancer cell. And instead of the car veering off, of course you get far too many cells grow. And uh, other things, your, your brake lights, your indicators, how your car interacts with other cars on the road, the cell can lose those properties and they cannot communicate so effectively with our other cells or the gears can break, or the accelerator can set, get, get stuck. And all those kind of properties are exactly what goes, on, goes wrong in, in a cancer cell. So this is my team of detectives. They're all smiling, so I obviously wasn't there that day. <laughs> um, but they're all great, young, hard-working scientists, all trying to understand what's wrong with ECLL cells, and hopefully we can exploit that to help patients with CLL. So this is my team here. So we're now detectives. Um, I would like to say that I'm Sherlock Holmes, but the truth is that's probably more like me there. <laughs> Slightly more blundering. And... But anyway, we go and we look at the crime scene, which in this case is the genomes of the cancer cells. And much like <coughs> a policeman would gain molecular forensic evidence, we do exactly the same thing. In fact, some of the DNA tools that they use in police work are quite similar to the tools that, that we use in trying to understand what's wrong with the, with the genome of patients with cancer. So we, we look through all that evidence and we're looking for trends, we're looking for similarities, we're trying to get, find what the story is and what the common trait is that is driving all these different ca cancers. And now, like in many areas, we're doing much more work with, with computers, big computers, big data, um, to look for these trends. And then, obviously, the idea is to find those cancer genes or those criminals. 
Okay, so, and this has largely been facilitated by massive improvements in the technology that we've used, as you can imagine. So, in about 95, a collection of scientists from all over the world started the Human Genome Project, which you may have heard of, and it published its first draft sequence in 2001. So it took probably from inception about 10 years. It cost about $100 million to do that, and it was a global effort to, to sequence one person's genome. And it was an amazing resource. And we still use it now, because you need the normal genome to understand what's abnormal in the chemistry. You know, you know, if you don't know what's abnormal, you don't know what normal is. But now, <coughs> we're at the stage where we can do that work, and we do that work in our labs as we sequence genomes. And you can do it in a month, and it could cost you five thousand dollars rather than one hundred million dollars, which it did not that long ago. So, in the same way as we've gone from these old computers to our, our microchips, the same developments have occurred with really lab on a chip, and you can do experiments on these chips now in one day that a scientist. 15 years ago, couldn't do in their whole career. You couldn't produce as much data, but you can now produce on these small glass slides, basically. And I'll take, just take you through the technology very quickly. So what we do with DNA sequencing is we take DNA from our patient and we cut it into little bits. And we put it on these glass slides here. And this starry sky you see here with these white dots on the black background, each one of these dots is a little bit of DNA, a sequence of DNA, about 300 base pairs in length. And you can see there's a lot of dots. And that dot only represents a tiny little bit of one of these lines of sequencing, which only represents one of eight. So you're producing billions and billions of bits of sequence, and we're sequencing each one. So you can imagine, that, that took one, like 100 million dollars to do in one person. You can now do it on that little bit. And then what we do is we sequence using, sorry, using coloured, using fluorescent DNA dyes, we then sequence each one of these little dots using different colours. And because the DNA is coming up from the glass surface, you can imagine this is kind of coming up like seaweed from the bottom of the sea, we can add a dye at each spot that's a different colour for a different type of nucleotide, and then we can sequence each one of those fragments of DNA, and then we can use computation to put them all together to give us an idea of what the whole genome looks like. So, and that's been done, and we've made enormous progress in the last, even the last five years, which is when the CLL genome sequencing project was first started and the first paper was published. So, before all that sequencing information, we knew really about two genes one of which you've heard about, and ATM is another gene involved with DNA repair, how, how the cell responds to DNA damage. That's all we knew about. But as a consequence of this very powerful technology, we're now in this situation. So rather than two genes, we now have a lot of genes that are all harbor recurrent mutations. So these are those mutations in more than one individual. Those mutations affect the way the protein works. So they're important contributors, not the only contributors, about later, but they're important contributors in the sub-cohort of patients. And we hope that they'll allow us to establish the better ways of monitoring patients. And also, as you may know, we can now use small molecule therapeutics to target some of these genes and render the, the, the dysfunction uh, harmless in, in those patients. At least that's the plan. So, there's a lot of rare mutations that exist in there. So are they really that important? Are they passengers or are they drivers? Well, what you can do is you can position all these genes into a small number of pathways. Now, by pathway, I mean a kind of biological process that exists in the cell. And when you take all these mutations, what you end up doing is identifying particular pathways that are dysregulated by mutations. Mutations don't explain the, pathogen, the whole pathogenesis of CLL, of course, they don't, but they are important factors. And why is that important? So, well, firstly, these are all the mutations that we found. 
The ones that are underlined in, in bold there are ones that our group has kind of contributed to finding or, or can counter, I think. But importantly, I think, what these pathways do is offer ther therapeutic potential. Because in other diseases or in other tumours, um, small molecule inhibitors are being developed that might have an application in tumour. And I'll give you one example, which is Andy is in the back, Dr. Steele. This is his data um, that we perform with, with Andy. His group and our group collaborated together. He's probably in a much better place to explain it than me, actually. But, um, but through collaboration with uh, a guy in Japan at the Rikon Institute in Kyoto, uh, we were able to get access to a splice of own inhibitor. So it, it inhibits that particular mutated gene that we had found. And our hypothesis, or Andy's hypothesis, was that CLL cells would be exquisitely sensitive to being killed by this drug. So we went about trying to understand if that was the case in when we took uh, CRL cells from patients and we looked them in the lab and we treated them with splices back in A and we wanted to find out if it worked and if so, how, how it worked. Um, so Andy did that, so he did a lot of work and then he also understood how that drug works. So I won't tell you about that. All I'll tell you about is this couple of plots here which just show this is the IC50, so this is the amount of drug it needs to kill the cell. So the lower these dots go down, the more sensitive those cells are to that drug. And what it shows is that the CLL cells are, are really sensitive to this drug. So it's really quite exciting. And when you look at matched normal cells, so the non-tumor associated cells, well, those cells aren't so prone to treatment killing. And actually, if you take CLL patients that have normal B cells in their body as well as the tumor cells, and you fact purify the normal cells from patients with CLL, it, again, it seems that that drug pre preferentially kills the CLL cells and doesn't kill the no normal cells. So that's a really positive preliminary insight into how genetics can end up identifying th th therapeutic options. And this, sorry, this slide, I think it's a Mac PC issue. Um, and this is a slide that, that, that Francesco showed you earlier, and this is a that he was involved in from a group in Italy. And I don't know if you remember, but I showed you a Kaplan Meyer at the beginning, and it had this good risk group with 13 key deletions. Do you remember? They were, the, they were the best ones. But there were still events happening. There were still people, unfortunately, that dying from their disease in that group. There was heterogeneity in that group. And what this study was able to do was it was able to look at that good risk, that historical good risk group, and try and add new mutations in to see if that made the model any better. And what they were able to do is identify this good risk group with 13 key deletions and pull out about a third of them that had mutations in these new genes. They were able to improve the prognostic power of that model to such an extent, that Francesco said, that we can now identify a group of patients um, that have CLL but have survival exactly the same as a risk patient or not significantly dissimilar to a group of patients that, that don't have CLL at all. So we're beginning to be able to identify groups of patients that have different outcomes. Do we know who this is? Darwin. Why am I talking about Charles Darwin? What's that got to do with anything? So as you know, probably better than I, in 1859 he published his um, theory of natural selection, where he showed with finches, now there his, there's, there his finches, that he proposed that the finch with the beak that was most effective at getting food, that feature would be selected for, because they were more able to get food than uh, finches with different shapes of feet. So that was Charles Darwin. But actually, a French genetic epidemiologist sometime before that had suggested that the length of a uh, giraffe neck was something that would have been selected for by, by them having access to more food. And this is his book. Uh, this is Charles Darwin's book where he drew this diagram which is really showing the ancestor and how 
uh, different branches of the population have occurred over millions of years as, as selective pressure has been applied to a population and selective favorable traits that then go on to dominate populations. So we need several things for Darwin's natural selection to occur. We need a population with a lot of different traits. We have to have diversity. We have to have birds with lots of different types of beak so the right beak can be selected for. It has to be passed from one ge generation to, to, to another. So there has to be, it has to be um, selected for. And then we have to apply selective pressure. And in this context, it's, it's the need for food. And, of course, these three properties, uh, any cancer biologist will tell you, are exactly some of the properties that ca cancer cells have. So you can apply Darwinian principles to cancer, the dark side of Dar uh, Dar Darwinian evolution, if you will. And that's one of the things that we're doing now. We're using a variety of different technologies to understand the clonal um, the evolution of ca cancer. And why is that important? Good question. So this is a, a branching um, diagram of clonal evolution within a cancer cell, starting from, from, the, from the band of cells. So diversity happens because genomics is the ability to play. It's acquiring different properties. Then, for example, it's confined to the primary site, but it needs to escape into, the, into, the, into some distal site. And of course, one cell will probably have the properties to do that. So that selective pressure will select the right cell, which will then grow. And then as metastasis happens, when treatment occurs, treatment will be a, a tremendous selective pressure on the cell. Some will die. And in fact, the vast majority will die. But there may be some cells that have just the right properties that overcome the therapy. So by understanding the evolution of cancer, we can understand what the early events are, because if we want to cure the cancer, we want to target whatever is in all the cells, rather than what occurs over here, because we'll just kill, we'll just might kill these cells. And also it tells us about what cells go on to drive the disease at, at the different stages. So not that we'd want to cut down the tree, but you can imagine if you want to get rid of that tree, you don't cut off one of the little branches, one of the little, little twigs, you obviously saw through the trunk. And again, we are trying to identify which of all those genetic lesions are trunk lesions. So therefore, if we target them with therapy, we will get rid of all the tumor, tumor cells rather than just some. And again, the same kind of factors might apply there. And CLL is a really exciting example, a really exciting model to do this. Because the cells are in this critical blood, we can get them whenever we like, and these patients can live for obviously long periods of time. Um, often they're diagnosed by chance as part of another blood workup study, so we can get even samples from the NBL cases, and we can track the, the clone evolution that exists in these cells. And this is just showing you that. So we've got, a, we've got one patient with, with their white cell count um, going up and down, and symptoms become uh, become induced here, treatments required, knock the white cell count down, and so on and so forth. And we can take CLL cells from each one of those time points. We can compare them to the normal germline, the normal DNA that, that patient has, and we can build trees of the evolution of that patient's cancer. And I just thought I'd give you one example of just such a, a patient who is in Bournemouth, well, one of our collaborators in Bournemouth. And this patient was diagnosed in 2002 with CLL with a, with a 13Q deletion and mutated IGHD gene. And hopefully, you'll remember that that's a good risk pr profile. So the clinical management of this patient was based on that, that sort of diagnostic workup. And this patient was defined as having good risk disease. And we worked on those patients. We worked on patients that had good risk profiles of diagnosis, but progressed. The, the hypothesis was there were a good group of patients to find new ways of understanding what drives the disease and therefore translating that into improving clinical care. 
So what we did is we sequenced the whole genome of these patients, and we could confirm that indeed at diagnosis we can find this do dominant population with a deletion of 13Q. And this is the, the population that the diagnostic workup found. However, with our increased resolution and our increased technology, what we also found was a 4% cell that had a trisosome 12, which is one extra copy of chromosome 12, and a number of other gene mutations, which wouldn't have been found with the established kind of diagnostic workup. So we performed that same profiling about 10 year, years later, and this dominant clone that had defined that patient's diagnosis was lost. We couldn't see it there at all. So that cell population is completely gone. However, this small population that we missed at diagnosis was now expanding, was becoming more dominant within this patient's tumor. More mutations were, were, were there, so it's evolving, the genome's evolving. And again, I think two, two years later, one or two years later, we looked again, it's now moved from 22% to 70%, and it's got a NOTCH1 mutation. Now, NOTCH1 is one of the new genes we found in CLR, and it identifies a subgroup of CLR patients that don't do so well. So it kind of all, all fits. Unfortunately, we then, uh, this patient, there was further selection, so we, we lost these mutations. And this is all without treatment. We always imagined that the principal selective pressure would, would be treatment. So there's something going on in these tumors that's selecting for different the patient had two rounds of therapy and unfortunately didn't respond to either. And post those two rounds of therapy, this clone becomes more and more dominant, more mutations are required. And again, these two mutations in black are two further mutations that have recently been proposed in literature to be bad things to have. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the patient passed away about two years ago uh, uh, after being treated a further time. Now, one really useful thing might be to see if we can find this population of cells, the population of cells that ultimately cause this patient to be ill, if we can find them right back at the beginning of disease. Because if we did, then maybe we might be able to have predicted this patient's course better and we might have been able to manage that patient in a different way. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. But what I also wanted to say is that based on the immunoglobulin status, this is mutated, this immunoglobulin at diagnosis. But by tracking the evolution of the mutated and un unmutated clones, we could show actually this patient has CLL twice. They have two different, completely distinct populations of, of CLL cells. One that was dominated early and was lost, and that was the, the population that defined how that patient was managed. And then one population of cells that we couldn't detect with diagnostic work up at diagnosis, but then that was the population that ultimately t took over as the disease progressed. So, just to give you an insight in into the power of this technology, this is just showing you the different mutations that exist in this patient at, in at diagnosis. Where the further along this line, the little black, blue and red dots go, the more uh, in the more cells they're in. So they're the, they're the mutations that define the diagnostic mutated clone. However, if we look at that notch one mutation that was predominant right at the end of the disease, you could find that mutation right back in the, in the diagnostic cycle. And that basically constitutes about six cells in every thousand cells. So that and we've done quite a lot of experimental work to show that that cell is real and it is the cell that ultimately went on to cause the, the patient to succumb to his symptoms. So what are we now doing? Last slide, I think. We're now trying to understand this at a single cell level. We now have the capacity to do all that stuff I talked about on patients, like sequencing genomes. We can now genome sequence single cells. So we can take the DNA out of a single cell, and we can get a whole ge genome sequence, or we can do other ways of understanding um, what a single cell is doing. Of course, it's a single cell that is 
going to be very important in predicting how a patient does because it's a clonally related disorder that's probably acquired by a single cell, and it's a single cell probably that drove the progression in that last patient. So what we're doing now is we're basically doing similar work, but we're doing it on fax purified single cells. So we're, 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 faxing, we're using a, a fax purifying system to put single cells into little wells, and then we can do our, gen our genetic analysis, and we can look at the presence of antibodies number of these different genetic markers in single cells, and we can create very accurate phylogenetic trees of that, of the evolution of that cancer, the hope being that we really will be able to understand exactly uh, what the properties are of, that, of that, that initiating cell, and how the different selective pressures that are observed in our cancer populations affect the cells as they evolve. So, last, second time I've said last slide, but anyway, this is the last slide. So, hopefully, um, it hasn't been too expensive for you, but hopefully, I've been able to introduce you to how genetics can help in the clinical management of patients with CLL and can facilitate the identification of some exciting, uh, not novel therapeutic strategies, though, of course, uh, work is required to prove those, the, the utility of those. And we're now really going on to try and look, think about what the early CLL cell is from, a, from a, a genomic standpoint and map these cells as they go through the natural history of, a, of, of patients with CLL. And of course, we're very translatable, uh, translational in our approach. And uh, of course, these experiments, the ultimate uh, result must be improvements in, in, in clinical care and work very closely with Francesca and others to take our observations and um, put them into a situation where they can benefit the patients. Um, and just as an aside, uh, all the patients that, 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 that Francesca has in the clinic, we're currently putting them to do type of this experiment. So hopefully we'll have a much better idea of what constitutes these di different uh, populations of cells within these patients. And hopefully it will help the way that, that, that Francesca can manage their clinical care. So hopefully that's been useful to you. Please do ask any questions should you have them. And thank you for your attention.